Hi Church, what a joy and a privilege to greet you through this video. Today we have an amazing guest speaker, Reverend Edmund Chan, all the way from Singapore. I'm deeply thankful to the Lord for Pastor Edmund, for his life and his ministry. You know that my life has been personally impacted by Pastor Edmund. When he came into our lives, when God gave me a divine appointment with him and he came into our lives, our lives actually changed and transformed for the glory of God. Because I saw in him a man who's after God, pursuing God wholeheartedly. Not only that, he has left a legacy of disciple making in his own church. I love him dearly and I'm thankful to the Lord for the privilege that I can call him my mentor and my spiritual father and friend. So this morning, I know that you're going to be greatly blessed by the word. So put your hands together and prepare your hearts. Let's welcome Pastor Edmund. Hi, everyone. I want to read you our text for today. It's taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 to 13. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. Verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Heather Robinson told of an occasion where he was a guest preacher. He got up to the pulpit uttered a single word, die, and he sat down again. The congregation, comprising several elderly folks, was surprised. Shortly, he got out the pulpit again and he said, now that I got your attention, and he went on to preach about death and the blessed hope in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting for younger preachers to do what my prof did. After all, he was the Heather Robinson. Nonetheless, one of the principles he had highlighted is a worthy one. Remember that you will die. To live a meaningful life, we must be meaningfully cognizant of our mortality. Nowadays, the average human life spent is about 80 years. That means your entire life is made up of, hopefully, 4,160 weeks. And to live this remaining years well, we must be weaned off our activity addiction, our accomplishment validations, and our acquisition compulsions. Oh, life is too short to live purposelessly and far too precious to live frivolously. We need to reverse engineer our life. And to do it, we must begin with the end in mind. We must grasp the end game. I've titled today's message, Knowing the End Game. Understanding this puts everything else in sharp focus. It helps us to determine what's essential and what's non-essential. Oh, otherwise we spend so much of our time engaged in empty pursuits, caught in the tsunami of shallow things. And then we wonder, where did our time go? The dictionary definition of endgame is the finish, the grand finale, the climax, the clincher. Now, the end game is essentially about knowing what is ultimately important at the end, the grand finale. For what is ultimately important is not the appearance of things along the journey, but the reality of things at the end of it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 to 13, Paul reveals to us the end game as he prays an earnest prayer for the Thessalonian church. There are four key aspects of Paul's prayer that gives us the end game focus. One, the end game focus on God as he directs us. Two, the end game focus on community as he unites us. Three, the end game focus on calling as he sanctifies us. And four, the end game focus on Christ as he returns for us. Let's explore this one at a time. First, the end game focus on God as He directs us. 
Verse 11 says, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Here's a brief background. Around AD 49 to 50, Paul, Silas and Timothy, the three mission musketeers, preached the gospel in Thessalonica and planted a new church there. Then persecution came and Paul had to flee in the middle of the night. So Paul instructed his disciple Timothy to follow up on them. All the while, Paul was trying to return to visit the Thessalonian church, but he faced difficulties. Now, Tim came back with an excellent report. And Paul took up his apostolic pen and wrote a letter to encourage the church. This letter is 1 Thessalonians. In it, Paul expressed several times his desire to return to them. And then he made this prayer that God would direct his way to them. You see, for Paul, he has no desire except to proceed as God directs. Recently, I was reading up online and I came across a post which said, this is my life. I want to truly live while I'm alive. So I do what I like. I understand the sentiment and I applaud the intentionality. But then again, it could foster an unwholesome selfishness if I just do what I like. You see, we must grow and learn to be other-centered as well. So alternatively, one might also say, this is my life. I want to meaningfully live while I'm alive, so I do what my loved ones like. That's good at loving. Ah, but for the disciples of Christ, there is yet another lesson to be learned, and that is this. This is my life. I want to faithfully live while I'm alive, so I do what the Lord likes. What God directs, we do. Actually, it may sound simple, but in actual practice, we need both wisdom and courage. The wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it. For example, what if I sense God directing me to sing aloud on board a commercial plane? If I do it, some might support my courage, while others would question not just my wisdom, but also my singing ability. But wait, what if I sense God directing me to sing aloud on board a plane and I did, and it sparked an online controversy? That's exactly what happened to Jonathan Neal on Good Friday when he performed a worship song on board a plane. I don't know Jonathan personally. I truly wish him well. I'm grateful that he was on a mission trip to Ukraine. It shows his compassion. I'm grateful he asked permission before he sang. It showed his presence of mind. I'm grateful that he did not keep on singing until the plane touched down at Changi Airport. It showed that he was measured in what he did. And I'm so sorry for all the criticism this young man had received by a vast majority who were not even on the plane that day. But the most pertinent question in this entire episode is not, is it right or wrong to sing a worship song on a commercial flight? There would always be a diversity of views and a cacophony of voices. Rather, a gentle question for us all is, what have we learned? My entire point is this, in the end game, the direction of the Lord is of ultimate importance. In the final analysis, in the end game, what's important is not merely how much we accomplish for God, but whether we have proceeded as God directs. And to do as God directs require wisdom. Interestingly, in the wisdom literature of the scriptures, in Proverbs 27 verse 14, it says, he that blessed his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning 
it shall be counted a curse to him. A blessing can be counted a curse without the wisdom of efficacy. I define efficacy as doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, with the right motive to achieve the right result. Hence, it's vital that we keep on asking, what have I learned? And what must I learn so that I can do what God directs with wisdom and courage? Now, here's the critical question to test if you have truly understood what I said. If I, Edmund Chan, were on board that plane that day, would I join Jonathan Neal in his public singing? Or do you think? Already, I can envisage a polarity of views. Some would say, of course, Edmund Chan would do it. Others would go like, but why, duh? That's why there's a controversy. Now, my own answer is yes and no. But listen, whether it's yes or no is not focused on circumstances. It's focused on the end game. So no, if I don't clearly sense the Lord directing me to, and yes, if I clearly sense the Lord directing me to. You see, at the end of the day, it boils down to the leading of the Lord. Now get this, anyone who deals with any controversy will be applauded by some and vilified by others. So why then would I raise this controversy here? Because I want to move us beyond the surface issue to a deeper focus, the end game. At the heart of the issue is not, is this right or wrong? For there's no moral criminality involved. Neither is it the question, is it well received or not? For you could have a standing ovation in the plane and have just one disgruntled passenger and the controversy would still be there. Rather, the central question for Jonathan, for me, and for you is this. How do we grow in knowing the Lord's leading, and how do we follow it in wisdom and with courage? So to that end, we must graciously give one another space to learn from our journey if we are willing to learn. But what if I'm wrong? Then I humbly learn from it. Learning to discern the Lord's leading is part of that lifelong spiritual growth journey. Now here then is the central question. How do I truly know that this is the Lord directing me? Let me succinctly give you four key considerations. Number one, don't be too flippant in saying the Lord spoke to me or the Lord is directing me. Instead, discern the source. The voice in your head comes from one of three sources. The deception of the evil one or the prompting of the spirit or in many cases, it's just from yourself. It's, a, it's common in the desire for validation to have a self-generated idea and be too quick to term it as the Lord spoke to me. Don't be too flippant with that term. Next, yield your ego to God. Sometimes we get really excited about doing something for God and we think it's God leading us when it's our ego speaking. Yielding our ego to God makes it easier for us to be directed by God rather than directed by self. Third, I ask the Lord for wisdom. The wisdom to clarify His leading and to have the clarity in how I ought to fulfill what He has directed. So when I sense God is leading me in a certain direction, I still need to ask for His wisdom in how do I follow and fulfill that leading. And fourth, I learn from each encounter. 
At times when we are too timid, God will nudge us to be more courageous. Or at times when we are too impulsive, God will nudge us to be more restrained. So here's the bottom line. Be God-directed. Don't be too flippant. Yield your ego. Walk in wisdom and learn from the journey. The second endgame focus is the focus of community as He unites us. Look at verse 12. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. Recently, I had breakfast with a pastor in our city. He struggled with a very difficult family situation compounded by a difficult child. For parents with difficult children, you all know it's not easy. So it's a rather common struggle, not just for this pastor, but for many Christian parents. And then this pastor told me of the best advice he had received. It helped him immensely in his family struggle. And this advice came from an older lay person. So, what is this best advice that he received from this senior citizen who gave it to this pastor? It was simply three words. Just love him. Just love him. What is true of the family is true of the church. Let us truly love one another, for love is that which binds us in unity. It is so sad when the church is disunited. Tom Rayner tells of an unnamed church which was reaching many people. Members were sharing the gospel, members were inviting people to church, and then it stopped. It did not take long to discover the problem. You see, the church was reconfiguring its worship centre and foyer and they needed a larger welcome centre so they reduced the worship seating capacity. The focal point of the contention was the remodelling of the worship centre. The old pews have to be removed and a decision had to be made. Pews or chairs. Oh, no one anticipated the strong emotions that resulted. There were members with strong feelings on both sides. In the meantime, the growth came to a standstill. One church member sadly said, we went from an evangelistic church to a fighting church. Love and growth disappeared over a silly contention, pews or chairs. They completely missed the end game. In application, that doesn't mean that we do not have disagreements. We must make a distinction between disagreements and disunity. In a sense, healthy differences of opinions foster a holistic appreciation of ideas, progress, growth. However, disunity is different. Disunity is harmful for four reasons. Number one, it divides the body of Christ. Two, it propagates a culture of mistrust and suspicion. Three, it surfaces competitiveness and strife. And four, it compromises our mission and brings shame to the Lord. Charles Spurgeon once said, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. The mission of the church is not merely to proclaim the gospel. More significantly, our missional calling is to lift out the life-transforming power of the gospel in our lives. By demonstrating our love for one another, we bear witness to God's saving grace. Christian unity and love is a witness before the watching world. I remember most fondly our first GDC partnership. 
GDC, the Global Discipleship Congress in 2013. Can you imagine two different churches in two different countries with two different cultures, with two senior pastors, two leadership teams with different expertise, different ways of doing things, different preferences. And yet we came together, shared together, worked together, prayed together, and pulled off a historic Global Discipleship Congress represented by 61 nations. And all this was hosted in a massive new church building at CCF in Manila. And just a month before GDC, it wasn't even completed for the conference. But God was in it. And we saw the building finish just in time to host its first conference. Significantly, in that grand adventure of faith and prayer, a singular prayer stood out for me. It wasn't merely that the building would be ready for GDC. It wasn't merely that GDC would go on smoothly in her planned program. It wasn't merely that GDC would be a blessing to the participants. Rather, the singular prayer that captured my heart was this, Lord, when all this is over, let it be truly said that we truly love one another, that we truly love one another. You see, Pastor Peter Tanchi and I are kindred spirit disciple-making pastors and very dear friends. We love each other as beloved brothers in Christ. But more than it just being between Peter Tanchi and myself, I desire that the leadership teams we lead would also love one another as we collaborated on GDC. Hence, my regular prayer was, Lord, when all this is over, let it be true that we truly love one another. And the Lord, the Lord heard and answered that prayer. Sure, it was hard work. And understandably, there were inevitable differences, differences in style, differences in preferences, differences and differing opinions from two cultures. But we listened to one another, honoured one another, served one another, and demonstrated in truth that we love one another. Now, this is also true of Covenant EFC. Anne's late grandma once said, your church really love one another. In her own Cantonese words, your church really has heart. Your church really has love. And it was through that love that she came to know Christ at the age of 92 and was baptized. Love is the measure of all things. It is the end game focus. The third end game focus is the focus on calling as he sanctifies us. Verse 13, the first part. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father. It has often been said that we are called and destined for greatness. And that's true, but inadequate. And what's worse, we are often inclined to define greatness in a self-serving, anthropocentric way. I submit to you that holiness is the defining attribute of God. Let me give you a reminder from Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he heard the heavenly host proclaim the superlative, holy, holy, holy. In English, you highlight a superlative by adding the word most or very. For example, this is very true or this is most true. In Hebrew, to highlight a superlative, you repeat the word. Truly, truly means most true or holy, holy means most holy. So when Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, this is most true. Now, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, there is something without parallel in all Hebrew literature, a superlative of superlatives, holy, holy, holy. Holiness is the defining attribute of God. 
It is holiness which most defines God. Tony Evans called holiness the centerpiece of God's attributes. Of all the things that God is, at the very center of His being, God is holy. God's holiness is central to understanding who God really is and all that He does. Consider that never in the Bible, God is called love, 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 or eternal, 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 or truth, truth, truth. Yes, He is all that, but the superlative is not used. Yet twice in the Bible, God is emphatically and superlatively defined by His central attribute, holy, holy, holy. He's holy in His love, holy in His truth, holy in His eternal presence. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Can you see it? The greatness of God is cradled by the holiness of God. Now get this, our destiny is tied to our calling and our calling is tied to God who is holy. And because God is holy, we are called to be holy. That's our calling. That's the end game. But here's the problem. We are not holy and we don't want to be holy. The word holiness seems to be an awkward word today. Do you see that man? He's a holy man. Awkward. Do you see that woman? She's a holy woman. How awkward. Holiness doesn't just seem to be awkward. It seems to be something irrelevant, something that is totally removed from ordinary life. And even if we don't see holiness as something awkward or irrelevant, we often think of it as something quite unattainable. It is impractical in the real world. Ah, but Paul doesn't see it that way. In fact, Paul sees it as, okay, let's get back to the basics. Who are we? He comes right back to the core issue of core identity. We are a people of God. We are a certain kind, not the perfect kind, but the set apart by God for God kind, the holy kind. God calls us unto holiness. He works holiness. He sanctifies us. For Paul insists that God is at work in us. Of course, Paul knows we can't be holy by ourselves. It is not in our nature, even though it's in God's nature. So Paul tells us the good news, that God sanctifies us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, the second part, it says that God established us to be without blame in holiness before our God and Father. The church is a holiness movement. It is not merely a coffee and donut, kumbaya singing social club. Rather, it is the sacred ground upon which we expect the sanctifying work of God. It is a sacred ground upon which we expect an encounter with God. It is a sacred ground upon which we expect the extraordinary. In his book, Rut, Rot or Revival, A.W. Tozer states, The treacherous enemy facing the Church of Jesus Christ today is the dictatorship of the routine, when the routine becomes Lord in the life of the Church. Programs are organized and the prevailing conditions are accepted as normal. Anyone can predict next Sunday's service and what will happen. This seems to be the most deadly threat in the church today. When we come to the place where everything can be predicted and nobody expects anything unusual from God, we are in a rut. That would be perfectly all right and proper for a cemetery. Nobody expects anything out of those buried in the cemetery. But the church is not a cemetery and we should expect much more from it. Because what has been should not be Lord to tell us what is, and what is should not be ruler to tell us what will be. God's people are supposed to grow 
And A.W. Tozer says, as long as there is growth, there is an air of unpredictability. Keith Jetty, who wrote the hymn In Christ Alone, says there are three signs of the church on the decline. One, the church becomes decreasingly knowledgeable about God. Two, the church becomes increasingly obsessed with itself. And three, the church views every part of the spiritual walk for what they can get out of it. The postmodern church has become utilitarian, consumeristic as a church, rather than a movement of holiness. We got to disciple towards a movement of holiness, not by our own efforts, but by the sanctifying work of God. For mind you, that's the end game. Finally, the fourth end game focus is the focus on Christ as He returns for us. Look at the last part of verse 13. It says, blameless, uh, without blame in holiness before God the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. This brings us to the thrust of verses 11 to verse 13, which is a pivotal point in Paul's letter. For here, Paul shifts his focus towards the future, the end game. And in so doing, he points us to the return of Jesus. That's the grand finale in the end game. Recently, I caught up with an old friend, Don Graybill by Zoom. Don has held key command and field assignments in the U.S. Air Force. And he was a staff officer at the Pentagon. And then he answered the Lord's call to join the Navigators, where he eventually served as the National Co-Director of the Church Ministry Discipleship. Don Graybill visited one of our IDMC conferences, and we became dear old friends. We had a special time catching up. And just before we hung up, he said to me, let me share with you one last story. Some years ago, he watched a Penn State football game with his wife, Marilyn. Oh, the first quarter was bad. The second quarter was worse. Disappointed, he turned the VCR on to record the game and went off to bed. Next morning at breakfast, he was told Penn State won the game. Unbelievable, really? He put on the VCR and he watched the third and the fourth quarters. But the third quarter was as bad as the second quarter. Then sat on the sofa thinking momentarily, we're going to lose this game. But wait, he realized that the results are already out and that they have already won. It was declared Penn State won the game. So Don relaxed. He was reminded that they have already won and he sat back and enjoyed the rest of the game. What changed? He knew the outcome. He knew the way the game would end. As we consider the end game today, let's keep our focus on Christ. For in Him, we know how the game would end. And as Christians, we are different from the world. The world speaks about future uncertainties, but in Christ Jesus, we can speak of a future certainty, the coming of the Lord. And with all this happening around the world, with its collateral uncertainties, we can have clarity and courage, the clarity of knowing that our Lord's return is near and the courage to live unto His end game. Let me close with this story. When Billy Graham was 92 years old, he was struggling with Parkinson's disease. In January, a month before his 93rd birthday, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited Billy Graham to a luncheon in his honour. Billy Graham initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he struggled with Parkinson's disease. Oh, but the Charlotte leaders said, we don't expect a major address. Just come and let us honour you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about him, Dr. Graham stepped up to the rostrum, looked at the crowd and said, I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist who this month has been honoured by Time magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once travelling from Princeton on a train. When the conductor came down the aisles, 
punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket. He couldn't find his ticket. So he reached into his trousers pocket. It wasn't there. He looked into his briefcase but couldn't find it. And then he looked in the seat beside him. He still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. And as he was about to move to the next car, the conductor turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees, looking under his seat for his ticket. He quickly said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are, no problem. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. Having said that, Billy Graham continued, See the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren are telling me I've gotten a little slovenly in my old age. So I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried. And when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Oh, may each of us live lives so that when the ticket is punched, we don't have to worry about where we are going. You've got to know your end game. Do you know Jesus? Come to Him today. There's a chorus that goes like this. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. Do you really know Jesus? For He alone commands the entire stage of the entire end game. Would you turn to Jesus today? Let us pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, turn our eyes upon Jesus that we might behold His wonderful face, that we might engage with His redemptive purpose, that our lives might find its meaning and its purpose in Christ Jesus. Tutor us in the theology of the end game so that our focus might be in fulfilling Your will, in love for one another, with the sanctification of holiness as we wait for our Lord's return. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.